the moment people don't necessarily walk to the fridge in the retail store to find a red wine. They look on the shelves and they're used to drinking a red wine with their steak or a cold winter night in front of the fire. We've got a job to do in kind of changing people's perceptions of red wine and educating them that whenever you would normally reach for a rosé or a craft beer or a seltzer, that there's a red wine there that will give you an amazing taste profile but also really fit into that occasion. You can't sit in a business like wine, which is pretty much like fashion. You can't sit there and wait for the next 20 years to come around and to be doing something new again. You have to always be innovating and, and changing. If you sit and wait, you die. As a generation four of a company called Brown Brothers, we're actually led by eight women and two men in our generation. I think as a woman working in the wine industry, we can only be proud of the steps that we've made forward. Every time I get the next step done, we get closer to getting this wine in tank, blended, and essentially to the bottle. Certainly not the end of the road in terms of being a stressed winemaker. Challenges like this come up once in a generation. At a $20 proposition, I would find this not premium enough. Certainly not as fresh for second one. With the feedback given today, um, we've got to make some really fundamental changes. You could look at a winemaker being like an artist. It's like putting your art on show and waiting for the critics to come through, and you guys are the critics. I expected more colour from the pressings. Going to start off with wine one, the uh, 2022 Tarango. If this wine doesn't turn out the way we we're hoping it was going to, and it ends up getting rejected by the retailer, it's going to come back to me. So the pressure's on. Brothers was founded in 1889 by our great-grandfather, John Francis Brown, and he started um, here in Miller as more of a hobby farm, um, and he planted 10 acres of Shiraz here in the site in Miller. But really, I don't think he had any idea that it would become the wine business that it is today. Now, we're 133 years on, and we're proud to say we're still a family-owned business. Today um, is a really special day. We have our annual Brown Family Conference. Being part of this family is an absolute privilege. Being able to share something that is bigger than us. It's a huge legacy and really we see it ourselves as custodians and it's our responsibility really to take this business and take this legacy and make sure that it's stronger when we get to pass it on to the next generation to come. At the lunch today, we're gonna to have representation from the third generation, the fourth generation, and the fifth generation of the Brown family. Whenever um, kind of presenting ideas to the family, there's naturally a lot of um, anxiety, um, a little bit of stress presenting to them. You're always kind of on point. You need to be on point. Got something to say, Emma? <laughs> Um, firstly, how exciting to uh, all be here today for a family conference and I think um, a huge opportunity for us to be thinking about the future. So we've certainly seen the red wine category decline over the years, which is really concerning seeing big varietals such as Shiraz and Cabernet leading declines in the Australian market, but consumers' tastes and preferences are starting to move away from those heavier reds and starting to look towards kind of casual, lighter, refreshing categories such as seltzers, RTDs, craft beers, and we're missing out on a huge opportunity. How we're looking to do that is through Tarango. Catherine is about to embark in um, vintage with the winemaking team um, to make this Tarango product that's suited to these occasions. It sounds like a little bit of a blast from the past for us. Uncle John, you did such an amazing job developing this Tarango grape varietal that's designed for the Australian climate, something that you have been exploring since the, the late 70s into the 80s that is absolutely right now finding it's time to shine. So watch this space and I'm excited to go on the journey with you all. Well done. Love, yeah. love, yeah. love Tarango. <laughs> Dad would say, look at the ruby color. Isn't that beautiful? The situation in Lebanon today is very hard with uh, 
next war situation or call it whatever. But I don't look at it that way. My, my only conviction is to my family. My father was a general in the Lebanese army. And I looked up at him like my hero, my hero at the age of 11. And he put a gun in my hands and he said, it's gonna send you back a little, but you try to, to, to stay as firm as you can and you shoot in the middle. It's like if you are shooting somebody between the eyes. You got it? I said, yes, dad, I'm gonna do my best. I enjoyed it actually. It's a terrible thing to tell a, a child of 11 to do that, but he meant it to have his daughters be strong and up to any situation, life would bring you along. He prepared us actually. It has always been part of my life, wine and war. We are four sisters and I was the one who liked best to be next to him and to enjoy making wine. And that was a dream of his, which came true. I loved the idea of him starting a winery. And he didn't need to be encouraged. He was so passionate about everything he did. Well, sad enough, he left us. And since then, I took it up myself to continue his heritage. I'm very proud of having a dad like this. And for me, to carry on his legacy wasn't an easy thing. I don't know whether to say that a woman in a man's world is a easy task, but it was worth trying. This is why I believe in wine. This is why I'm giving you all this story to give you a philosophy. What is wine? Wine is beyond anything you could think of. The biggest medicine on earth, the biggest miracle. Wine is the link between God and humanity. Wine is the link. Should I continue or should I stop? No, I stop. <laughs> Done. <laughs> We imagine that wine is another product. Wine is not another product. It's another life. And because we cannot master and control life, we cannot pretend that we can control wine. It's such an unbelievable teacher. Because wine makes people communicate. And when you communicate, you can make peace. You don't make war. You don't know yet what it tastes like. It hasn't grown yet. We need to let the wine be the whole bottle. And he had this wonderful line where he said, just like people, wine is something that you cannot judge until you've seen it through every season of its being. So don't rush to a judgment on anybody or anything until you've seen it through every season of its incarnation. And I have never forgotten that. I cannot tell you how many times when I'm in conflict with somebody in a relationship, whether it's a friend or a relative or a neighbor, I just think, we're not done with this bottle of wine yet. Before you start labeling this person or, or sort of putting them in a box or, or deciding something about them, just wait. You haven't seen them through all their seasons yet. This is just a moment in this person's life, and you're at a moment in your life, and tomorrow they're going to be completely different, and so are you. So just hold back. That was always his thing. Wait, not so fast, right? Not so fast. And don't judge it. Don't declare anything. Just watch the story unfold. And, and that, to me, is spiritual mastery.
us is an amphora. Clay vessels like this have been used for thousands of years throughout much of the world. One purpose, and the reason we're here today, is that amphora have played a key role in the history of wine. Anthropologists believe that vessels like this go back 8,000 years and were used for fermenting, storing, and trading wine between cultures. Today, there's an exciting movement focused on these vessels taking place on California's central coast in San Luis Obispo County. Throughout the ages, every country and culture has had its own shapes and names for these clay vessels. Today, these winemaking jars, large and small, are referred to simply as amphora. We have been doing a series called Fato a Mano, which means made by hand, um, that all go into amphora. A good question is why on earth would you use one? You know, it's, uh, it's cool, they're ancient. The fact that they even existed anymore, I had no idea about. Experimenting is, you know, always uh, an important facet of, of making wine, um, or really anything in life, you know, the more you experiment, the more you, you learn about your environment and, and what, um, how things react. A lot of my colleagues I hear talk about that a lot, like we call this the Wild West, right? It's very much um, an area where people could um, come and do whatever they wanted. There was no rules, there was, it, it, the, the world is your oyster. We don't really want to just fit a bill for, for uh, for somebody or a, a certain target audience, we want to just strive to be different, unique, and taste good at the same time. <laughs> so what are you going to do that, that is unique and that is different, and how are you going to make it special? I'm not surprised to learn that this county has so many individuals looking at something old as something possibly new because really the zeitgeist of our local industry with wine is one of expansion, diversion, and amelioration in a, in a new sense of the word, which is an old word for winemaking. Today, most wines are fermented in stainless steel, concrete tanks, or oak barrels, and then the wines are moved to or remain in barrels for aging, the oak often adding layers of flavor to the wines. But these winemakers in San Luis Obispo County have begun to think more broadly about how their wines express themselves. Farmers at heart, the winemakers I'm meeting are all philosophically wedded to nature and to history. They've all begun to use amphora. Is it because they want to explore the past? Or is there some winemaking secret hidden deep inside these big clay pots? I'm curious to find out.